We won in Virginia. We won. How good does it feel to win? I mean, after all the losses that we have suffered the last two years, man, relish this, relish this. There is so much to talk about about Virginia. Honestly, it's going to take almost the whole show to talk about it, but I want to show you two videos first. So I'm slated to speak at the University of Michigan to the YAF, the YAF group there, the Young Americas for Freedom group uh, tomorrow, which is Thursday, November 4th. I'm going to be speaking at 7 p.m. to the students there. And in anticipation of my arrival on campus, the students plastered posters all over their campus to invite people of differing viewpoints who also attend my speech. That's the fun of these events, right? It's both like-minded people who need to be encouraged, and it's also these live question and answers where liberals can come and challenge me, and we can debate these topics that we're talking about, these hot-button issues. So you can see, obviously, you can see these posters plastered all over campus here. But wait a second. What happened after these students plastered these posters all over campus? Well, it looks, it appears that the liberals on the University of Michigan campus do not want you to hear what I have to say, what I am going to say tomorrow. They ripped all of these posters advertising my event down. They stuffed them in the trash. You can, again, you can see this. By the way, look at the caption on this video at the very bottom. Look at the caption. Uh, I'm glad they recycled. At least they recycled. That's, that's, that's quite funny. Yes, at least they recycled these posters. Um, if they don't want you to hear what I have to say, that is your clue that you absolutely should attend this event. This is not just open to students at the University of Michigan. This is open to anybody. You can go to my Twitter account to find out how you can attend tomorrow, Thursday, um, November 4th at 7 p.m. If you're not in the area and you still want to listen to my speech, by the way, the topic of the speech is the left hates women and children. And I back it up 100%. If you're not in the area and you still want to watch, you can watch it live streaming on YAF's YouTube channel, which is YAF TV. Fully invite everyone, student or not, to watch this. And leftists who ripped down these posters and stuffed them so responsibly in the recycling bin on campus, please take a front row seat at my event. Challenge me, engage with me, talk to me, debate with me. I promise you will not be disappointed. We're going to talk about Virginia next. I'm Liz Wheeler. This is The Liz Wheeler Show. But first, I want to talk to you about Disco. I think it's pretty universal that if you're a man, you know you should be using some sort of skincare products in your face, but you're never exactly sure what to use, so it ends up that you don't do it. In fact, uh, one of the guys on set today asked, should I be using something on my face? To which I responded, please do, please do. Um, you, you really should if you want to eliminate bags under your eyes, if your skin is too dry, maybe your partner wants you to make some changes, you're tired of razor burn, unhappy with the way your skin looks, but you're just not sure exactly how to go about addressing those issues. If any of this rings a bell for you, then you should try the skincare line that my husband has been using recently. It's called Disco. Disco is a clean skincare brand based in Austin, Texas. All Disco products are created specifically for male skin issues like under eye bags, dark circles, acne, razor burn, oily skin, dry skin, wrinkles, you name it. Disco products are easy to use. They show you exactly how to use it. They have a starter set, so there's no guesswork. If you want to check out Disco and try their incredible skincare products for yourself, we have a very special offer for the Liz Wheeler Show audience. Go to letsdisco.com and enter Liz at checkout for 30% off your first order. That's letsdisco.com with Liz for 30% off your first order. And thank you, Disco, for this incredible offer just for listeners of this show. Winning feels so good. I take, uh, I have zero problem with relishing a win. In fact, I like to just immerse myself in this glorious feeling of victory. In the state of Virginia, a massive red wave crashed over the entire state. The citizens of Virginia have freed themselves from the bonds of critical race theory and radical leftist ideology. This is the sentence I've been waiting months to say. McAuliffe has lost. Yunkin has won. Marxists? You lose. You lose. And it was not just Yunkin, by the way. This was a trifecta. This was the governor race, the lieutenant governor race, and the attorney general all lost. The leftists all lost. The Republicans all won. I mean, it, it's, it's even better than that. It's even better than that. If possible, as you can see, I'm reveling in this victory, as we should. Winsome Sears um, is the first Black woman elected statewide in the state of Virginia a conservative black woman, the lieutenant governor of Virginia. I am so proud of this woman. Did you guys see the picture of her holding that gigantic rifle? This is who we want to be representing us in our uh, self-governing system. A woman like this, a conservative woman. 
a woman who defends herself, a woman who breaks barriers based on her achievement and not based on immutable characteristics. I mean, this is this is so amazing. So Jason Mayaris was the Republican candidate for attorney general, defeated incumbent attorney general, a Democrat, of course, Mark Herring. Um, as I said, th- this is the perspective of this race. Barack Obama turned out to campaign for Terry McAuliffe. Kamala Harris turned out to campaign for Terry McAuliffe. Stacey Abrams turned out to campaign for Terry McAuliffe. And still, critical race theory is so poisonous. The ideology is so poisonous that even some of the the biggest names in democratic politics, Obama, Kamala, Stacey Abrams, could not defeat, could not defeat the opposition to critical race theory. This is something. I mean, this is really a big deal. And I know people, I know a lot of so-called experts, a lot of consultants say, listen, these, these races that are on off election years, it's not a, it's not a big uh, midterm election, it's not a presidential election, they're not really a bellwether of what's to come. And this is what I would say. This is a bellwether of one thing. This is a bellwether of what happens when an otherwise, I don't know, kind of mediocre Republican candidate with all due respect to Glenn Youngkin. I mean, he's not, he's not ideologically so far to the right or so strong in his principles that, you know, he's going to be the next DeSantis or the next president of the United States, I don't think. But when he constructs a campaign centered entirely around what matters to the people in his state, he doesn't quibble with what is important to those in Washington, D.C., He doesn't quibble with what's important to those across the country. He centered his campaign solely around what mattered to the parents in the state of Virginia. This is smart campaigning. This is how Republicans win. I've been saying this for weeks. This race was never about the right versus the left, per se. Glenn Youngkin constructed his campaign to be the left versus parents. That's a winning strategy. He didn't even make it about himself. I mean, Glenn Youngkin is actually, for having gotten so much national media attention, he's actually still relatively low profile in a sense. He still flies kind of under the radar because he made this this campaign, this election about principles and policy, not about himself, not about his own personality. This is something, this is what's a bellwether here. This is what's a bellwether for what Republicans should do moving forward. Um, so let, let's ask the question. I, I want to dissect this in whole. Why did, why did besides these, these vague, large, wide-reaching, okay, he made this about the policy and not about himself, why specifically did parents dislike Terry McAuliffe when just last year, the state of Virginia elected Joe Biden by over 10 points? Joe Biden won the state of Virginia by over 10 points. Why the huge shift in the space of one year to now they elected a Republican governor? Here's why because Biden is so radical that he has appointed an attorney general, Merrick Garland, who called the parents in Virginia who did not want their children being indoctrinated with critical race theory, who did not want their daughters to be physically at risk in bathrooms where biological males who wear skirts actually commit rape. He called these parents who show up to school board meetings opposing these radical policies, he called them domestic terrorists. That's number one. As Megan Megan Kelly had one of the best tweets last night in response to Youngkin's win, she said, the domestic terrorists would not be silenced. Amen to that. You call parents domestic terrorists. Do you not understand? This is is what I don't get. Did, Did McAuliffe not understand the idea of waking the bear, poking the bear of Mama Grizzly? You come after our children and you don't stand a chance. Not a single chance. So we have... Attorney General Garland calling parents domestic terrorists for caring about what their children are taught in school. We have this policy in Virginia, um, in Virginia public schools of gender neutral bathrooms, transgender bathrooms. And not only does this deny reality, deny biology, deny the the fact that boys and girls are different, men and women are different, we have the Loudoun County rape cover-up where a boy wearing a skirt, a biological male wearing a skirt, raped a ninth grade girl, a freshman girl, raped her, in the bathroom and the school district covered it up because they knew that it would reflect badly on their gender neutral transgender bathroom policy. They covered it up. That's why her father went ballistic in the school board because the school board was denying knowledge of the sexual assault. They called the police, the school school district or the school administrators called the police, not on the alleged rapist, who by the way was alleged at the time, but now he's convicted. 
They called the police on the father who was going ballistic in defense of his daughter. You have woken the bear. You have woken the mama and papa grizzly. And then Terry McAuliffe has the audacity to deny that critical race theory was being taught in schools. We all know that this is a trick. I talked about this two days ago on the show, or yesterday on the show, I should say. We know that this is a trick because there's a difference between teaching the abstract academic version of critical race theory versus applying the principles of critical race theory to all of your curricula. That's what Loudoun County is doing. That is what Virginia public schools are doing. And that's worse than teaching the abstract academic version of it. But then, this is the moment. This is the exact moment, I think, when parents in Virginia, it doesn't matter if they were Republican or Democrat, said, I'm not voting for Terry McAuliffe. This was the one sentence, the one moment that caused Terry McAuliffe to lose. Listen to this. Veto books, Glenn, not to be knowledge about it, also take them off the shelves. And I'm not going to let parents come into schools and actually take books out and make their own decision. You vetoed it. So, yeah, I stopped the bill that I don't think parents should be telling schools what they should teach. But, you know, I get really tired. The audacity of this politician who's supposed to represent the people saying that parents shouldn't have a say, shouldn't tell schools what to teach. Who do you think you are, sir? But he admitted it. He admitted how radical he was. He did the opposite of what Biden did in the campaign two years ago. Terry McAuliffe embraced how radical he is. He exposed his own ideology. He doubled down on this ideology, saying parents shouldn't have any veto power, any power to ban even pornographic books from the libraries of the schools the children, their children are attending. What parent in their right mind would vote for this man? And that's exactly what happened. That's what happened yesterday. Parents said, why on earth would I vote for this man? And Glenn Youngkin exercised incredible discipline throughout this entire campaign. And what did he do? He gave McAuliffe enough rope to hang himself with. He exercised discipline in not talking about topics that were important to the rest of the country, to the Beltway, even on the international stage. He just talked about issues that are important to Virginia citizens critical race theory and transgender bathrooms and the radical extreme leftist ideology that is taken over that dominates Terry McAuliffe. This is why Terry McAuliffe lost in a state that's not a red state by any measure. And Glenn Youngkin let it happen. Glenn Youngkin was just quiet while Terry McAuliffe said there's too many white teachers teaching in schools. Terry McAuliffe admitted that he wanted to exercise racial discrimination against teachers based on the color of their skin. And Glenn Youngkin said, make sure you listen to what McAuliffe is saying. I will do the opposite. So this this is what happens. What we saw in Virginia yesterday, this trifecta victory, the governor, the lieutenant governor, the attorney general, all Republican victories, the Democrats all defeated. This is what happens when the left tries to turn kids into transgender racists, when the left tells parents that they should have no say over what is being poured into the minds of their innocent children. Marxists, you lose. If this is not the most encouraging thing for Republicans who have been discouraged watching the left uh, seemingly pocket victory after victory, we now have a template for what to do to win. However, however, As we revel in this victory, as we feel joy that good has triumphed over evil, that our children in Virginia are going to be at least somewhat protected, we cannot become complacent. No, no. In fact, there was something that happened yesterday that actually shows us that we should take five minutes max to celebrate this victory, and then we have major work to do before next year's election. We're going to talk about that in a second. But first, let me talk to you about The Spectator. As the longest-running magazine in the world, The Spectator believes that journalism must be both witty and insightful. But more importantly, they believe that ideas should be discussed without the constant threat of cancellation. How refreshing in this day and age with the mainstream media wanting to cancel everybody who's conservative. No, no, The Spectator never confuses the serious with the dull. They're not right-wing or left-wing. They believe in challenging, informing, and entertaining readers. So sign up today and you will receive three months of both the print and digital magazine plus a free Spectator hat. Who doesn't want one? Just use offer code Liz at checkout to redeem the special offer just for listeners of this podcast. Go to spectatorworld.com dot com slash special offer and use the promo code Liz. I personally love The Spectator because they're dedicated to wit, which entertains me, strong reasoning and brilliant writing. That is a winning combination. Even if you disagree with the politics, you are guaranteed to be entertained. So sign up today to get three months of The Spectator for free, plus a free Spectator hat. 
when you subscribe today, spectatorworld.com slash special offer and use the offer code Liz at checkout to redeem your offer. That's spectatorworld.com slash special offer, offer code Liz. The Democrats had a plan. The Democrats had a plan of what they were going to do to try to tip this election in their favor. The problem with their plan, the reason it didn't work, and by the way, McAuliffe has officially conceded, so the race is over. It does not appear that it's going to be challenged or cheated at this point. But the only reason, it, in my opinion, the only reason that this plan was not put into action was because it was not a close win. This was not, you know, a fingernail breadth away close for each other. This was not a few votes that separated. No, no, this was a this was a landslide. There was no way that this could have been um, stolen. Let's just use that word. There's no way that this could have been stolen, but that doesn't mean that the Democrats did not attempt to or want to or even start their plan into action. This is what I mean. I'm talking about Fairfax County. I'm talking about what happened in Fairfax County. So around just before eight o'clock last night, um, Fairfax County through Democratic operatives, by the way, announced that they were delayed in counting and reporting their early vote totals. Now, given what happened in 2020, Fairfax County had said, listen, we are going to announce the results of the early votes, the tally of early votes by eight o'clock. Um, they did not do that in 2020. It was very late. That's part of what the problem was in Virginia last year is that it took so long to announce these early vote tallies. Well, they said, we're going to announce it by eight o'clock. It gets close to eight o'clock. And Fairfax County says, well, actually, we're not going to hit this deadline. We, we haven't counted all of these. We can't announce this yet. They said they didn't have an idea of how long it would still take them. It was, it was undetermined. That's shady thing, number one. Then a few minutes after that, Terry McAuliffe's campaign, and I don't know why it was Terry McAuliffe's campaign. Why was this coming from the Democrats versus coming from you know, the county, perhaps, or the election officials themselves? Why this came through the Terry McAuliffe campaign is a question that we should have answered. But uh, after the original announcement in Fairfax County that they were going to be delayed in counting the tally of early votes, Terry McAuliffe's campaign said that a certain number, they did not name the number, a certain number of early votes that came in in Fairfax County were going to have to be re-scanned. Okay? This seems shady. Why did they have to be re-scanned? Did they not were they not counted properly the first time? This, I mean, if, you're, if your buzzer doesn't go off, your suspicion buzzer, if, you, if everything is not saying, warning, warning, something not right here, then maybe it's because you weren't paying attention last year in the election. But this is really, really shady. This is exactly what happened in 2020, where early votes were recounted or they're, they're tally was delayed and being announced. And this is where we got into the middle of the night nonsense, where the chain of ownership of those ballots last year, that there wasn't a clear, a clear chain of ownership. So we didn't know if they'd been corrupted. This is what the Democrats were teeing up in the state of Virginia last night in Fairfax County, because Fairfax County is the largest population of voters in the state of Virginia, the largest concentrated population of voters in the state of Virginia. So what was the Terry McAuliffe campaign planning? It seems to me that they were waiting to see how many votes they were going to lose by, to see how many of these ballots needed to be rescanned, and oh, oh, come out in Terry McAuliffe's favor. This is why, even as we celebrate this victory, we revel in the victory, we praise God that critical race theory has been defeated in the state of Virginia, why we don't stop fighting for just a moment. Because if we do not, if we do not push with all of our might for election integrity laws, if we do not secure our elections against fraud and mismanagement and chaos, then what happened in 2020 is going to happen again. The Democrats are emboldened because they got away with it. Everything that happened last year, sure, some states like Georgia and Florida and Texas have passed election integrity laws. But meanwhile, the Democrats fought these tooth and nail but for the most part, the Democrats got away with what they did last year. They got away with electioneering. They got away with changing the rules and using COVID as a justification, changing the rules in ways they weren't even allowed to change the rules with early voting and universal mail-in ballots and changing the dates that you have to submit um, absentee ballots and uh, signature uh, verification being essentially eliminated on requests for absentee ballots. All of these different things, which I call electioneering, 
that changed, that probably changed the outcome of the election. There's no way to prove it because there haven't been thorough enough audits to actually find the truth. The Democrats got away with it. So if we, the American people, do not demand that our elected representatives secure our elections, the Democrats are going to do this again. And we know this based on last night, because if it had been even just a little bit closer, if the outcome of this election had been even a little bit tighter, McAuliffe and Youngkin, just a few votes closer together, then it looks like the Democrats were planning to cheat again. It looks like the Democrats were planning to say, well, maybe we found some other ballots. Let's rescan these ballots. Maybe they're going to switch to McAuliffe. Maybe we just boost the tallies on this side. We can't allow this to happen again. We have to stop early voting. We have to stop universal mail-in ballots. We have to make sure voter ID laws and signature verification prevent anybody from corrupting the integrity of each and every one of our votes. And if we don't do this, it doesn't matter what kind of ideological arguments we have. It doesn't matter how good of a campaign we win. If there is a statewide or national election that is even the slightest bit closer than the election last night, we're not going to have confidence in the outcome of the election if we lose. And why should we? So revel in this victory, celebrate this victory, praise God that our children aren't going to be corrupted by critical race theory and, you know, dangerous transgender ideology that puts girls in physical danger in bathrooms in public schools in Virginia. Yes, celebrate all of that. I certainly am. Winning is fun. And we shouldn't take the fun out of it, but we also shouldn't stop fighting for one second because we have a lot of work to do, a lot of work to do. The Democrats, by the way, there was another shady thing they tried during the day, during voting yesterday. They tried to tell people that they were forced to wear a mask if they wanted to cast their ballot in person. And this was not true. This was not true. But election officials, the the, the poll workers, tried to turn people away if they were not wearing masks. There was one individual who said on Twitter last night, they attempted this at my early voting location in Alexandria. I had to threaten to call the Virginia Board of Elections before the administrator let me vote. And this person, this was not an isolated incident. Ben Dominich at The Federalist said, yeah, they tried this with me as well. The the Glenn Youngkin campaign and the Republicans in the state of Virginia actually had to send text messages out to Republican voters saying, listen, they're trying to make you wear masks, but you do not have to do this. If you see this happen, if they try this tactic on you, call us. This is the party, by the way. This stunt was pulled by the party who tells us that Republicans are engaging in voter suppression, trying to discourage voters from going to the polls. What is this? What is this? Trying to tell someone that they have to meet a a different arbitrary, certainly not legal standard in order to cast their ballot? Is that not voter suppression? Is that not discouraging people from coming to the polls and doing so with animus towards the people not wearing masks, which the Democrats assumed would have a certain political viewpoint. These Democrats are slimy. They're smarmy. They may not be in power in Virginia right now, but if the Republicans win the House of Delegates in the state of Virginia, they appear poised to also sweep the House of Delegates. Virginia must enact voter integrity, election integrity reform, and protect the integrity of our elections so the American people can trust the results when they happen. So Democrats can't cheat, so no one can steal the election, so no one's vote is corrupted. And so we have the results of elections in a clear-cut, responsible manner on the day that the ballots are cast. I also want to talk about the role that President Trump played or did not play in this election because there's a lot of talk about this. I don't know if you guys saw MSNBC last night. I know. Who watches MSNBC for news? But, you know, sometimes I turn it on for entertainment. Last night, smoke coming out of the ears of these MSNBC commentators. But first, I want to talk to you about Nutrafol. So I've been palling around at this NatCon, at NatCon, the National Conservatism Conference. I've been palling around with Dave Rubin for the past three days. And I asked him, I don't know if you guys have noticed this, like, incredible wave that he has going on in his hair. And I asked him, you know, how did you actually achieve that? I constantly, I mean, I have hairspray on the floor trying to make my flyaways stay in place. And he literally told me, he's like, Nutrafol. I use Nutrafol. He used to shed hair from stress, and now he uses Nutrafol to get that thick, that healthy hair. Um, And they don't sponsor his show, so obviously I'm going to talk about it right here. It's not just Dave. This can happen to you, too. You can grow thicker, healthier hair, and you can support our show by going to Nutrafol.com and entering the promo code Liz to save $15 off your first month's subscription. That is their best offer anywhere, and it's only available to U.S. customers for a limited time. Plus, 
plus free shipping on every order. Get $15 off at Nutraful.com. It's spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L.com. Promo code Liz. Again, Dave Rubin uses it and look at his hair. I, I guarantee you actually that half the people are going to go Google Dave Rubin's hair after this. And you should because he uses Nutraful and it works. Be- before we even get into MSNBC's hilarious pity party last night, which really was entertaining to watch because they're just so, they're so outrageous. They're so insane. They're so radical. They simply can't stand the idea that a Republican defeats their poisonous ideology. I want to give a huge shout out to the poll watchers in the state of Virginia last night. I think the number in 2020, something like 36% of polls had um, poll watchers and the number skyrocketed in the space of one year, the number skyrocketed from 36% to over 90% of polls, polling locations in the state of Virginia had poll watchers. So that's a that's a service to our country right there. So each and every person who sacrificed their day yesterday, in addition to the training to make sure that the elect the integrity of each and every person's vote was intact, thank you for that. Um, that's really being a good citizen of the United States of America, a contributing citizen, taking part in our self-governance. And as someone who does not live in the state of Virginia, but has been watching this closely, I deeply appreciate it. And I know that I am not just speaking for myself. People across the country appreciate you protecting the integrity of our votes. So MSNBC having their little pity party last night, Joy Reid going absolutely nuts. They claimed, this is so funny, they claimed that they expected McAuliffe to lose. And when I saw that, I literally hooted with laughter. I was like, you did not expect McAuliffe to lose. You just can't stand that you're wrong about anything. You can't stand that. um, You can't stand that you lost. You're sore losers. Um, President Trump got 36% of the vote in Loudoun County last year, and Glenn Youngkin got significantly more than that. In fact, in early voting alone, the early vote tally, he got over 45%. And the Democrats try to make this race about President Trump, which is ridiculous. This actually had nothing to do with President Trump, and that's totally fine. Um, They're trying to make it about Trump because they can't engage on any of the issues. They can't defend McAuliffe because what McAuliffe says is indefensible, but they can't back away from him because they actually believe what McAuliffe is saying. What he actually just had the naivete, the stupidity, or the honesty, whichever, take your pick, to actually admit out loud. So President Trump had nothing to do with this race. And Republicans in Virginia, the Glenn Youngkin campaign, did a really good job not allowing the Democrats to change the conversation from what mattered to people in Virginia to the Democrats' Trump derangement syndrome. He did a very, very good job. The one place, the one commentary on the Republican Party as a whole that I think the Virginia race illustrates is that the national... Republican Party, meaning the RNC, is becoming more and more obsolete. I understand that they are a big part in fundraisers. I understand that they endorse here and there and whatever. But this is not a matter of the National Republican Party anymore handing down messages. We've become completely decentralized. And perhaps that's a good thing because we should have candidates in each state that's speaking to what's important to the people in each and every state. But it also shows that the RNC has become quite out of touch in how they support statewide races and how they support governor races and how they support things that are outside of Washington, D.C., especially when they have such a tremendous amount of money. I mean, the RNC gives basically zero dollars to try to take back California, something that I found extremely frustrating when I lived in that state, because there are pockets of conservative people in California. We can take back that state if we do it correctly, but the RNC has completely written them off because they no longer view California as a swing state or something that... um, or a state that we can turn red again, that there's any victory possible there. And the RNC, I think, should do some soul searching following this Virginia win, just in how they support candidates and how they give money towards candidates in statewide races, because I think that they can do a little bit better on that. Again, congratulations to the incoming governor, Glenn Youngkin, in Virginia, and his lieutenant governor, Winsome Sears, and the new attorney general, who is not a Democrat. This is absolutely wonderful. And this is going to be a very hard transition. On Locals earlier in the week, I said that I would comment on the Huma Abedin. That's, of course, Hillary Clinton's right-hand woman or former right-hand woman. Huma Abedin is publishing a book, and part of her press tour, she claimed, or she was talking about a story that she relates in the book. The story that she relates is that she was sexually assaulted by a sitting U.S. senator in the mid-2000s. Wow. This is a bombshell allegation. If this is true, this is, wow. This is crazy. However, however, if you read the excerpt of her book where in which she relates this incident, it's not exactly how the headlines describe it. In fact, I'm not going to be delicate about this. This is not sexual assault. If, 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 if 
what happened to Huma Abedin happened exactly as she related it in the book, that is not sexual assault. This is this is what um, the New York Post said. Abedin, the estranged wife of serial pervert and ex-con, former New York Congressman Anthony Weiner, said the assault happened after a dinner attended by a few senators and their aide. Clinton, for whom Abedin served as a longtime right hand, was not there. Um, this is what Abedin writes in her book, according to the Post. I ended up walking out with one of the senators, and soon we stopped in front of his building, and he invited me in for coffee. Once inside, he told me to make myself comfortable on the couch. This is according to the Post. She writes that the senator then took off his sport coat, rolled up his sleeves, and then made some coffee as they chatted. Then he, quote, this is whom Abedin's words in the book, plopped down to my right, put his left arm around my shoulder, and kissed me, pushing his tongue into my mouth, pressing me, pressing me back on the sofa. I was so utterly shocked, I pushed him away. All I wanted was for the last 10 seconds to be erased. The senator, Abedin said, this is the Post's report, apologized and told her he had misread the situation, then asked if she wanted to stay. Then I said something, Abedin writes, only the 20-something version of me would have come up with, I am so sorry, and walked out, trying to appear as nonchalant as possible. Abedin then writes that she did not recall this incident at all until, um, until the sexual assault allegations, the phony assault allegations against Brett Kavanaugh, Supreme Court nominee at the time, Brett Kavanaugh, in 2018. Here's what I would say. If this is what happened, and nothing else happened, just this, if this is an accurate, accurate portrayal of what happened, where's the sexual assault? This is not sexual assault. I mean, the sen if, if the senator said, I misread the situation, I thought that you had wanted to be kissed because you came up to my room with me at late at night after a dinner, sat down on my couch. That's not sexual assault. Maybe she didn't want to be kissed and that's fine. That is not sexual assault. If we trivialize sexual assault, if we assign any kind of unwanted advance, if we assign, if we label that as sexual assault, then how are men and women supposed to interact? How is, you know, the human nature of courtship supposed to happen? Because in a courtship, a man pursues a woman. That is traditionally how it happens. And in order to pursue, you have to make a move. And then that move is either accepted or rejected. This is, you know, this is the, the dance that happens between a man and woman. And sometimes the woman is not interested and the man has to back off. That's not sexual assault. That's simply what happens in life. And this is an insult to every victim who is actually every victim of a real sexual assault. Because the more you label things that aren't sexual assault as sexual assault, the less that people listen when an allegation of sexual assault is levied. And this is actually a perfect example of it. If it is true that a sitting U.S. senator sexually assaulted Huma Abedin, this should be an enormous story. This would be a big deal. But how many news networks covered this? How many interviews has she been on talking about this? Where's the believe all women crowd? They don't even believe her because they know that this is an inflated version if it happened the way that she related that it happened in the book. And you shouldn't be afraid to say that because you're actually defending true victims of real sexual assault by saying, don't trivialize this. Don't, assign, don't call something sexual assault when it's not because it degrades the meaning of sexual assault. We become desensitized to it because we don't think it's real. That is my take on whom Aberdeen's um, accusation of sexual assault. And like I said, the feminists and the Me Too movement who claim that they believe all women, I don't hear anything from them regarding this allegation from a very high-powered Democratic woman that she was sexually assaulted because they, even they, even the left, even the believe all women people know the truth and that in this case, you shouldn't believe all women because it's not always true. Before we go, I want to give a huge shout out to our locals VIP of the week. This would be QC Dweller 2022. QC Dweller, what does that username mean? What does this mean? Uh, post on Locals and let us know. Welcome to the Liz Wheeler Show community on Locals. Please introduce yourself by your real name or at least explain to us what your username means. Tell us where you're from, why you're here, how you heard about us, and what issues in your state are the most important to you as a voter. If we want to copy what Virginia did and take back all of these statewide uh, these statewide offices, then we need to focus on what people in each state care about and not just be so obsessed with the national and the federal elections. Anybody who is not part of the Liz Wheeler Show community on Locals, please join us. I extend you the invitation as always. It is lizwheelershow.com slash locals. We have a great time. There are live streams, hot takes, Q and A's behind the scenes. We've been doing tons of interviews here at the National Conservatism Conference in Orlando, Florida. Tons of interviews, which we will be dropping shortly. So please join us, lizwheelershow.com slash locals. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening today. I'm Liz Wheeler. This is The Liz Wheeler Show. The Liz Wheeler Show is produced by Jonathan Hay. Executive producer, Chad Abbott. Director of photography, Kevin McRoberts. 
Editor, Alejandro Figuerilla. Assistant Editor, Michael Wall. Sound Mixer, Robin Fenderson. Post-Production Manager, Victoria Metzel. Director of Marketing, Emily Washler. Production and Talent Coordinator, Matt Toffler. And Senior Publicist, Patricia Jackson. This has been a Soundfront production. If you haven't already, give this video a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button below, and ring the bell to make sure you never miss a video.